Um, let me introduce you to the last of our insider trading um, lectures. We, um, this series for the open house students who are here, this series is, is really meant to be uh, literally what it says, an insider trading, where we're trading information on the inside. And it's uh, meant to be work in progress, uh, uh, not, not perfectly polished, finished things, but um, really sort of ideas that are being put on the table. Um, and this semester, we've, we've started this series with uh, four faculty members presenting their work in progress. And Nehran is, is um, what is it you, when the, the last person is batting and the bases are loaded? And I don't know my sports <laughs> analogies. Anyway, Nehran's cleaning up the the game or whatever you say. <laughs> what? What Clean is up. it? Clean up hitter, right? Clean up hitter. There you go. I knew someone would know it. Um, I don't know what that uh, is. Neron Turan, this is her uh, second year as a junior faculty member. Um, she came to us from Harvard where she did a uh, doctorate in design. And uh, prior to that, she was at Yale where she did an MED. And, and prior to that, she studied architecture um, at the, what is the, the name of it? Istanbul, Istanbul Technical University, uh, where she got her Bachelor of Architecture, a professional architecture degree. Um, she practices architecture in the firm Neme, uh, which is, is based. Wow. Something just fell upstairs, but I think we're all OK. Um, the firm Neme, which is based here and in, in Boston. Um, she uh, writes uh, extensively and has been published extensively. Um, and here at the school, she teaches uh, studios. She told you earlier about her studio that went to Istanbul last uh, semester, the, the um, uh, graduate studio. And she's teaching an undergraduate studio this semester. And she also teaches seminars. Um, so without further ado, I welcome Neron to share her insider thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing this. This is really a great opportunity to, to uh, uh, compile material. And uh, in a way, it is a loose lecture. You will see it, that it's really perfect for the insider trading uh, series. And it really gave me a chance to uh, reflect on some of the things that, uh, in a more clearer way, I hope, uh, that I have been working on. Um, if, uh, in a way, I wanted to start with, um, with, with and, and you will just it's going gonna, it's gonna to start unclearly, which uh, it's just a joke. But in a way, a quote from Slavoj Zizek, I'm not going to talk about Zizek. As you can imagine, the title is Megaform, so there is really no relationship. Don't even, let's not go there. Um, but that, uh, in a way, it's kind of more about the, it's going to be a, a, a hint of my strategy for the talk. Um, he, Zizek says, is not love some kind of a cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with this notion of I love the world, I love the universe. Love for me is an extreme violent act. It is not I love you all. It means I pick out something and I say I love you more than anything else. If any lecture is a strategic grouping of material in order to invoke discussion, it is also by its nature a cosmic imbalance, similar to Zizek's description for love. That is, as any curatorial project, in, uh, intrinsic inclusiveness of the content matter of a lecture, i.e., I love you all, I love all my work, remains equally important as its radical exclusions, meaning I pick out something and I say I love you more, that work more than any others. Today, my presentation will use the pose of an inclusion, this uh, dichotomy between inclusion and ex exclusion, uh, in a strategic manner. That is, instead of presenting uh, an all-inclusive inclusive caption of my architectural work, which includes projects, as Sarah mentioned, produced at the NEME studio, a young office with just two founding principles at this moment, and my individual research, which most of it you uh, probably have already seen on the uh, faculty boards in the main hallway, I chose today uh, to present you a working theoretical traje trajectory that has developed from my work and has uh, taken further shape within my first year of teaching at Rice Architecture with the two design studios and, uh, and my, my seminar last semester. Uh, this trajectory also marks a line of thinking which uh, probably will always see what happens but continue to transform in my future work and, and, and also teaching here. So I'm really excited and 
truly honored. I'm both truly excited and honored, basically, to uh, share this work uh, with you, with with a special o uh, audience today. Uh, most of whom knowingly or unknowingly has contributed so much to my thinking in architecture before coming here and after coming here, and uh, will presumably continue to affect me in the near future. Um, the talk basically will have four parts. Uh, the first part will be the shortest part, where I will, I will give you a little bit of a prologue. Let's say if that is my faculty board, or this is just the faculty board is just two years, reflection of two years of work, but let's say I have a portfolio of work and I pick up points that I think how the points that led me to here, led me to the idea of megaform, but I don't want to turn into a kind of a personal history, which is important, but it's not the only thing that's important in the work. So, but I think that's important, like how really like a, an idea triggered itself and then I took it in many years and made it something else. And I, I'm sure it will really be something else in the future. Basically, my interest to, let's say, larger context in the larger way, I know it's a very vague term, I will try to deal with it as I go, um, basically started to haunt me first at my master's research thesis at Yale University. Some of the audience already edited, I remember, <laughs> that work in a publication, that's very interesting, um, that uh, basically developed through, uh, through my work. Uh, it was a master's research thesis. Uh, at Yale University, basically looking at, it was looking at specifically to, to the North Sea. North Sea as an, because at the time I was really amazed by, I was into the world of infrastructural urbanism and let's say Rem Kohlhaas' readings on the New York, but more on the how infrastructure as a grid system really transforms Manhattan or basically is for the rigorous ordering system that each unit is kind of transforms on that grid. What was interesting for me uh, for North Sea, basically this is like 1960s, post oil landscape, so it is an energy landscape, how a tabula rasa of the sea as a nothingness was really coded on a grid system, so like a city. But more than that, compared to Delirious New York, let's say, the grid itself was also shifting, how the infrastructural data was morphing, those lines, you see different countries and in front of them there are different grid <laughs> systems. So it's a, I would, now I look back to it, I see how it happened and in a way you can see it as a master's thesis, it has its own limitations, but that it's basically me, uh, I can see me totally dealing with, I was not so much into the formalisms of infrastructural urbanism at the time, but more into how, in terms of logic, how it, it was interesting to me. So that, let's say, I'm gonna skip, uh, so basically some, it, uh, it was a research, as I said, more of analytical research with speculative interpretations, um, was looking at, these are some original documents from, uh, sometimes the United Nations, there was, uh, because I was at Yale, I was really accessing some of the resources that I would never read, uh, US documents. Um, but that how the sea itself was basically not only as an infrastructural datum worked with the grid system, but how countries basically tried to define, coded the sea with, I mean, a lot of political, obviously, uh, resonance and relationships. So, in a certain way, I, this was this image was I found this image in one of the. Um, uh, it was really like a, an, a, another joke to me when I was doing the research because I was talking about uh, uh, Rem Kulhas's Manhattan and I see this document in a brochure uh, on the on the North Sea materials, like an oil rig next to a Manhattan building. So as if it was for me this idea of large as a joke, how it transformed to a kind of a building condition to a more of a infrastructural. Uh, let's say, symbiotic form. So that research, again, as I said, I took it to many levels. I speculatively used that material to write about it more, what it means for architecture and urbanism, uh, for other publications, what, what that system means. But then it's also overlapped and, let's say, transformed, mutated in another uh, research that I did, which was uh, my doctoral uh, research, which was about Istanbul. So that framing of the landscape and territory, or let's say looking at things in a larger context, affected the way um, I basically read the city. Not in a way that... So you, you didn't hear anything I said? You didn't have to. That part was, oh, okay, sorry. I tend to move sometimes when I speak, so uh, I shouldn't. Um, so um, that took me basically to uh, understanding 
let's say, the urban history of Istanbul more from a landscape and territory point of view. Not to go into mapping of the systems and roads, but more to a specific story in the 1930s in Istanbul, where uh, international com conventions, which is the Montreux Convention, really coded the Bosphorus Strait and how it was really related to some of the discussions of urbanism, geographic understanding of the city. So that uh, is, again, I'm not, I know, this skipping things very shortly is not a very good thing for a lecture, but I thought before getting into mega form, it would be nice to see uh, how you know, how that virus really started and how I'm taking it, where I'm taking it. While I was doing uh, this research, um, there was a conference in 2006, and, and then after I realized that actually I, I met Albert Pope there, which we didn't speak, but it was the first time I saw his work, um, that, in a, not his work, himself, um, that it led me to, it, the question, the, the title of the conference was Surfacing Urbanism. It was basically asking you again to tell the story of how infrastructures are important, flows and networks. It was really, that conference was an opportunity for me to sit down and basically question this fascination with infrastructures, this fascination with mapping. So the title of the essay, which I think is a kind of a tweak in my history of things or the way I look at urbanism, after mapping, urbanism and what is out there. What the essay was trying to do was that, let's say for more than a decade, architecture and urbanism, I was using uh, the mapping realities, which I'm gonna a little bit talk about, so I'm not gonna get into that right now, but that it was more of a, let's say, re-evaluation -eval of some of the tendencies <coughs> that were going on in um, architecture and urbanism in that time. So that uh, uh, essay and some of the discussions, and I'm not gonna go into, again, a personal history, but that led to a project, let's say, the MERS at Harvard GST, which was titled New Geographies. First, it started as a project, and then it uh, turned into a publication, which I was editor-in-chief for the New Geography Zero issue. Um, and the first issue came out uh, last year, titled After Zero. Uh, basically, I'm trying to, the second issue was trying to understand the crisis as a, both as a moment of potential, but also a, a tabula rasa moment that we should consider uh, the, let's say, disciplinary agencies in architecture and urbanism. So this is more of a, let's say, a kind of a project history. Um, uh, again, it's a publication, but it was, I should call it a project, really. Um, of questioning, uh, it's more, more for, for me, for myself, it was more of re-elaborating the after mapping essay to, to a, a larger spectrum and uh, a lot of discussions and feedback and also uh, get together people who have similar, let's say, frustrations and excitements in a, in a way. So it's a cooking project. Uh, um, so that is, uh, let's say, uh, and then these are some of the uh, images of the journal, which some pages leads me to the essay that I'm gonna, I hope by time I'm not, okay, that's good. Um, so the, as you saw, like the, the subtitle of my talk was Symptoms, Histories, and Projections. I'm also not a lover of subtitles, but uh, in this case, it really, really worked for me to, to, to structure the uh, essay for myself. Let's go with the symptoms. In his definition for the Dictionary of Human Geography, Derek Rogri defines geography as earth writing through its Greek roots, geo, earth, and graphia, writing. The practice, the practice of making geographies, geographing, according to Gregory's definition, involves both writing about the world by conveying, expressing, and representing it, and writing on the world by marking, shaping, or transforming it. One could argue that latent theorization of the geographic <coughs> paradigm, which some of the, I think, some of the ghosts are were already in my work, in architecture and urbanism within the last decades, focused on writing about the world more than on it. Situated within a much broader discussion of architecture's relation to wider context, discussions on the notion of large scale, have revolved around two discourses. Existing within a paradoxical relationship to each other, these two discourses continue to affect our understanding of the contemporary city, while I think they are totally latently manifest in, in the lexicon of our projects. I would like to outline these discourses as they will take me to the idea of megaform. The first discourse is based on the idea of endlessness, which would, in general terms, refer to the expanding horizontal surface of the city and it's beyond where the contemporary city is interpreted as the accumulation and the accommodation of unlimited flows and acts as a boundless and self-organizing system. 
Enabled and triggered by the dispersing qualities of urbanization, widespread effect of globalization and the dissolution of boundaries, the discourse on endlessness suggests an urbanism of flows, networks, and systems, and incorporates an understanding of ever larger emerging territories and scalar expansions in global thinking. If the world has been announced as flat and urbanism as splintered, one could argue that perhaps for a while it made perfect sense for architecture to think of the built environment as a mobile and seamless ground where everything was connected with networks. Complemented by, complemented by the timely arrival of studies such as Manuel Castell's Network Societies, I'm sure you're all familiar with all this, but Saskia Sassen's Global Cities, uh, David Harry's work, some geographers in uh, LA, Edward Soja, and many others in the 90s, early 90s, this first discourse, Endlessness, suggested a scalar expansion for the discipline, suggesting infrastructural ecological shifts. Uh, political shifts in scale for design and sparking further interest in better understanding of emerging phenomena in exploring larger territories as well as interdisciplinary uh, uh, leanings. According to this perspective, and in a ghostly way I'm using one of my images, uh, which I'm criticizing also, it's an interesting kind of uh, loop, architecture has been seen as a node of economy, politics, and culture, suggesting that these external forces constitute the full range of architecture's tools, procedures, and performances. By foregrounding ideas such as organization, flexibility, programming, statistics, scenario building, etc., and declaring classical architectural ideas regarding edge, center, symmetry, geometric systems, proportions, and hierarchies irrelevant, endlessness has suggested an urbanism of field conditions, networks, formlessness, space, process, and soft systems. For architecture, this first paradigm has re resulted with three uh, I'm giving you really like a rough sketch, which I think for me was a really good way of thinking, but um, you should bear with me that it's, it's, it's a loose, uh, loose essay in a way. But these three uh, schools of thinking which uh, informed each other in the early 90s were some of them, two of them, last two of them were more specific than others, but first has been an expanded interest in explorations of territories, infrastructures, transnational polity, which aimed to position architecture and urbanism with a much broader framework. Second was, uh, this is again a territorial, let's say, um, image. Second was disciplinary alignments, such as infrastructural and landscape urbanism, with their specific techniques and strategies. And it's very interesting that below here in Alex Wall's uh, article, it says contemporary metropolis and endless cityscape. Um, so um, more specifically, and the third so uh, was landscape, the third, second was landscape urbanism. Third was the pervasive phenomenon of research architecture, which included analytical leanings with data scaping, mapping, or more sociological leanings in everyday urbanism. While initial work disseminating from infrastructure and landscape urbanism imagined the infrastructure surface, script, matrix uh, as instrumental, operative, and adaptive, uh, only it worked so well on the post-industrial urban landscape, uh, or urbanism without architecture, as Robert Sommel uh, describes Stan Allen's work uh, in, his, uh, in his book. Um, abundant uh, airfields, contaminated waterfronts, or obsolete landfills were first sites of operation for flexibility, determinacy, and uncertainty were really underlying ideas. In a certain way, if uh, post-war contextualisms and emphasis of meaning and place had culminated with the dominance of urban form, let's say in the, uh, as it is in urban urbanism, over modernist space, so new urbanism took the idea of form, let's say in a way, rather than modernist space, the discourse which I'm trying to outline as endlessness brought an expanded dimension of space into architectural thinking. If the semiotic register uh, or an emphasis on uh, linguistics had hindered architecture's <coughs> intervening potential or transformational power on reality, this shift of endlessness, uh, mainly developing during again early 90s, foregrounded the instrumental, as I said, performative, uh, material, programmatic, systematic, processual uh, systems, uh, at least I should say in its claims, because I'm thinking of, um, I'm referring to St. Allen's infrastructure urbanism. Uh, these processes, performative, instrumental, over purely representational uh, realm, uh, and the claim was short, less with how things look like, more with what they do. Um, 
if Stan Ellis' claim was from architectural point of view, Charles Waltheim and Jace Corner uh, joined the club, or they were already in the same club, uh, talking about similar claims uh, about how landscape doesn't look like like a let, doesn't look like a picturesque, but how it operates as an agent in the connective as a connective tissue in the city. Um, although the emphasis on the operative and the performative, widely accepted by now that this is a kind of a post reading, I guess, the representation and form was already, they were already embedded ideas in that school of thinking, uh, which is an interesting, I think, looking back and evaluation of things. Um, as, uh, let's say for the mapping tendency, whether it's, let's say, in Stefano Boyer's multiplicity, Roll Bouchotin's Cora, and BRDV's uh, data scapes, um, James Corner's 80, 80 diagrams, or Rempool has his project on the city with the paranoid critical method uh, borrowed from surrealists that fi mixes fiction with reality. This analytical mapping was deployed as an instrument to generate an idea out of a given situation. As the city was conceived as evolving from uncontainable social economic forces, architects were forced to understand built environment as a reality as found with its complexities and contradictions, or retroactive manifestos, learning from emerging urban conurbations, new border zones, free trade areas, with novel cartographic techniques. Accordingly, the city expanded, we mapped with sophisticated cartography. Realities emerged, we researched, observed, named, and interpreted. Mostly fascinated with the inventive and clear maneuvers of realities, we tried to figure out what, what could architecture and urbanism learn from their latent ingenuity. It is evident that these investigations have created a necessary setting for much needed retroactive manifestos regarding those realities that were out of the picture before, uh, based upon convincing evidence. However, I would argue that they have also brought an, a bout of an unreceptive attitude towards the abundance of such evidence. Parallel to this course uh, on fluidity of the endless space, endlessness, a complementary and an equally widespread emphasis was given to the bounded form of urban islands or insularities of detachment, where general laws were suspended. Whether in the scale of atrium interiors, shopping malls, free trade zones, or gated communities, these autonomous islands, or let's say cities within cities, scattered on a vastly stretched horizontal plane. According to this discourse, the city becomes an archipelago of islands floating on a post-architectural landscape, in this case, one could argue it is architectural, of highly charged nothingness. Perhaps more specifically, the emphasis on the bound of form has created a mode of hyper subjectivity, as illustrated with iconic landmarks, as well as signature architectures. If you cannot read it, Kulhas says, of course, the very idea of the architect as a megastar is intrinsically absurd. And the interior says, of course. Being in a paradoxical relationship to the notion of endlessness, the bound of form not only foregrounds the architectural large object, it claims the idea of context redundant and replaces it with the infrastructure of the grid and the elevator. As you know what I'm talking about, Kuhas's bigness, bound of form became a testing ground for new architectural configurations. An extreme example of this, I'm, this is a, like a, let's say, a disciplinary joke, I guess, but putting um, this image, Captive Globe, with uh, a new project, a site in Ordos, where 100 architects were invited to design an object uh, on a new city to come, uh, in a way tells us uh, where we are, that uh, uh, mostly developing in, um, before the crisis, that in China, in the Ordos desert, I have actually a picture of the architects on the desert trying to figure out uh, really what to do with this landscape, taking photographs, basically defining the context, this nothingness condition, I guess. Um, and they're together here listening to a lecture about the site. Uh, it could be argued that while form is replaced by space or research in the discussions of endlessness, as described above, with the relaxation of the boundaries of the discipline, discussions around form have been limited to either nostalgic, new urbanist, uh, basically nostalgias, uh, or parametric urbanism in some ways, it's, it's not that clearly actually defined as the previous one, or autonomous point made based iconic landmark. If this highly charged nothingness of urbanism now becomes the city, the question is whether or not architecture is simply relinquished in favor of a post-architecture form, or does it really have a further agency? Rather than a limitation, I find this battle between architecture and urbanism, which I'm constructing again in the essay, but I think it's a helpful one, as a very important niche to bring the disciplinary agency of architecture, and more specifically, the politics of form, on the table. 
At the midst of endless space or the formlessness of landscape urbanism or designers' research on the one hand, they're both for me, formlessness, space, endless, without limit, or the bounded forms of expressive iconicist, nostalgic new urbanist, or the techno-savvy parametric, the idea of megaform interests me as a notion that has the ability to put the politics of form, as I said, on the table. By that I mean expression of architecture's publicness through the recasting of form, or more importantly, an architecture framing of the city. So basically putting, I guess, architecture back into this. Um, Appearing merely as a dichotomy embedded in the story of large scale, this rather sketchy dichotomy I tried to illustrate between ideas of endless and bounded obviously is nothing more than a story of this unsettling battle of disciplinary positioning. As much as of the figure architect here, I'm using uh, the matrix moment of Leo coming and really has to decide where to go, either save Trinity or save the world. I really see uh, Leo as the image of the architect save the world or save architecture. Uh, while the end endless space celebrates the interdisciplinarity of architecture, softening its disciplinary boundaries, and in an underscored and immersive attitude within external forces, and makes irrelevant the singularity uh, it suggests an uh, as an architecture, it suggests, uh, sorry, an architecture that's socially, ecologically, technologically, politically more engaged and becomes accommodation of these forces. On the other hand, the emphasis on bound of form marks the singularity of architecture. Architecture as a self-contained aesthetic object, not irreducible to the conditions that generate it. The dialectic between architecture's detached autonomy, uh, singularity, versus its total immersion with its externalities is beyond the scope of this essay. It's not a new story, as everybody knows in the room, and has always been paradoxical and has generated a broad spectrum of discussions within architecture history, especially post-war. At a deeper level, however, now new questions emerge at our present, especially in relation to questions of agency, disciplinary specificity, and form, without going resorting into one of those dichotomies. For instance, albeit to their radical beginnings, discussions about bigness, urban design, infrastructure urbanism, all clued for new, more tangible and specific strategic strategies of operation. It could be argued that, I don't know, maybe it's a fairly optimistic point of view, but what makes our current moment special in this regard is the existing of an advanced awareness for our generation, knowing that uh, the impossibility of result, like not only uh, going into uh, those, those total immersion versus autonomous object uh, resorts in their reductive conclusions, uh, rather for new horizons for speculation. This condition not only marks an important opportunity for building new interrelationship among these paradigms, but also suggests a moment for exploration, for new frameworks and trajectories for architecture and urbanism. Interesting enough, I see megaform, uh, as I said, I think that, I, I didn't say, it's the first time I'm saying it. I see megaform merely as an interesting topic just at this moment, that as something that brings the idea of form back to the table, by that I mean its potential to situate the aesthetic object in its political and social context without disintegrating its singularity. In that I see our current situation as an opportunity, as I said, for agency, for specificity. And before getting into, uh, these are the discussions really uh, literally started in my studios, but one has to see, it cannot just be mega form really has the potential to really link those boundaries, like dichotomies of endlessness and bounded. It's, it's not about that. It's more of when you look back into architectural history, mostly post-war, you see actually a very specific uh, forming of megaform, really acting within those dichotomies, which uh, are, work, are working actually as probes in my argument of pivotal moments that I think stand out in architectural history, where form is again like a gift architecture is brought back to the city to, to offer legibility to recasting of form. I don't know what happened to my slides, but here's what I wanted. The first probe is Fumiko Maki's uh, uh, collective form. And he is the first one who basically defined the idea of megaform. Here we see it's a very little booklet, it's not a very comprehensive. Uh, I think, a uh, book, but it's the first time that somebody uses the idea of megaform, the word megaform. So the left compositional form, he, uh, in a way, is the classic notion of the me space. Second, he names the picture as the megaform, and on the right, it's the group form. What is this, and the, the, the name of the booklet is Investigations in Collective Form. 
What interests me in his work, in, in this booklet and larger contextualizing Maki, uh, is the articulation, not only the articulation of large form, mostly as a reaction to the dispersing qualities of post-war city. Considering his strong connections, again, all of these probes that I'm laying out really have their own uh, historical lineages. I can't, I don't have time to go through, but um, I, I will try to make it as clear as possible. But his connections to Louis Sert at Harvard or Kevin Lynch at MIT, a theorization of the idea of legibility in collective forms uh, in the context of dispersion, is so understandable. You can totally take uh, Maki and understand where things are coming from. Um, not only suggestive in his iterations in the trilogy of compositional form, megaform, and group form, what makes Maki interesting in his use of the word megaform is the interchangeability to megastructure. Basically, he's using the word to mean both things. Megaform is megastructure for him. So the second image that you're seeing is either a megastructure or megaform. He means mega structure, but he says megaform. And he defines it as a large frame with discrete and rapidly changing functional units with, uh, which fits into a larger framework. So you see that clearly in the image. According to Maki, the collective nature of the, uh, this notion that makes it a megaform, he classifies them as hierarchical and open-ended. Maki's rather short description was taken after Rainer Benham in his book to a more encyclopedic collection of megastructural projects. What interests me, and I think that that's the second probe after this, is this very, uh, let's say, frictional relationship between megastructure and megaform. Although Maki's definition of both megastructure and megaform are the same thing, detecting their difference, and more importantly, a contested relationship, becomes an evidence of a battle, as I said, of, uh, on the one hand, expression of processes and networks, megastructure, versus giving shape and coherent form to it, which is megaform. I will elaborate what I mean by that. In my reading, it is this disjunction that makes the idea of megaform even interesting uh, to me right now. That is, one has to see the megaform and not only, uh, as an, uh, basically a notion that appears in moments of loosening of the limits of architecture, similar to the ambiguity between endlessness and bounding form I was trying to lay out. By loosening limits in this case, in the 60s, would be, I'm thinking here, uh, the, uh, I don't know what, okay, I'm gonna come back to that, I guess. Sorry, my slides are a bit, uh, I'm, when I say the uh, like loosening of limits, I'm thinking of the idea of think about the, uh, let's take um, environment, the emergence of environment, environmental design in the 70s, uh, in order to broaden the boundaries of the discipline. Uh, uh, I'm thinking of the work of Fuller, Doxiadis, uh, of its fully connected world, or McHale. Um, it's really these stories are really really interesting. I feel um, one has to. Uh, I really want to go through them, but I really want to get to the point. Um, um, let's say, um, or in a way, uh, let's say, you know, Doxiadis's uh, Econopolis, where the, the, the dream of a connected, fully uh, world, connections. So basically, emphasis to connections rather than, uh, let's say, uh, form. Or uh, one could see uh, the Andre Brance's non-figurative non architecture that contracts the new horizontal territories in a way that doesn't belong to the, that's what he says, it's a quote, that does not, horizontal, that does not belong to the excessively exhibitionist and vertical tradition of modernity. So it's a kind of, again, this emphasis on the horizontal. So the distinction between, so I'm saying that in a way the, I'm seeing, and I'm gonna show two or three ones that that emerging as megaform, that they don't have to use the word megaform, but uh, in these cases they do, that I see form coming back to the picture. Um, uh, by that, I don't, when I say, by the way, architecture, I mean form. And I don't necessarily mean at, the, at all the same time. I don't want you to associate to a building, per se, at for now. So the distinction between megaform and megastructure is made evident in uh, Kenneth, after Mackey, Kenneth Frampton's discuss discussions more clearly in his book, Megaform as Urban Landscape. Frampton, so that's the first time we see megastructure and megaform as really two different things. Frampton defines megaform as a large form extending horizontally rather than vertically, a large form which, unlike megastructure, is not articulated into a series of structural and mechanical subsets, as we find, for example, in Centre Pompidou. Uh, it's a form capable of inflecting existing urban landscape because of its topographical character. 
A form, these are all Frampton's descriptions, by the way. A form that's oriented towards the densification of urban fabric, and a form that's not freestanding, but rather insinuates itself in a condition surrounded to work. So we see, I mean, obviously, Frampton's articulation of a more geographic, like bringing his, I think, using the word, he's bringing place into the discussion of from for her for his interest mainly. And it's interesting to see how landscape urbanists took. Uh, let's say Kenneth Frampton's, he, they use the, this book all the time when they were, have to explain disciplinary positionings of landscape urbanism to more like a ground part of it. Let's say the, um, how the form emerges with the ground discussion. Where I would argue that if you really look at the book, uh, I'm not saying Frampton is not arguing that. I think he's totally, they're all happy with the landscape urbanism discussion. But that the examples, if you look at there, you would see that they're both large scale forms that uh, rather than landscape, let's say, a kind of an ambiguity between uh, ground and object. It is not surprising, actually, sorry, my, uh, it is not surprising that most of the project examples in Frampton's discussions, and this is one of them, are projects of neo-rationals architects of the 70s, who by the rapid post-war uh, urbanization were aiming to position the role of the architect in the shaping of the city. In the context of post-war Italy, criticizing megastructuralists, actually, like Kenzo Tange, Megaform's appearance was nothing more than a rejection of the analytical, uh, uh, too much urban analysis of sociological, economical analysis of architecture, which was pervasive at the time because of uh, dispersions and development, but rather positioning architecture at the concrete measure of the city. It is then easy to understand, when you want to uh, understand that context, Aldo Rossi's Centro de Razionale, or Mario Botta's Navisi Viaduct uh, Block Proposal for Perugia in 1977, or Vittorio Grogetti's two miles long project for the University of Calabria. This is Aldo Rossi. These are, I mean, in a way, uh, let's say Italy would be another probe or some of the neo-rationalist projects in that context of how situate uh, architecture into back into the city. Um, in, in that probe in, like, that I'm trying to construct as a backstory, there are other projects, obviously, and I'm not, again, uh, going to that, but uh, Team Tan's positioning within this of how the, let's say, expressive form became something else in their story, either map buildings or expression of aggregates, how network was basically expressed in the form. So it's a different story than, let's say, that neo-rationalist or other projects that I'm talking about. Um, Okay, I should be quick because I think. Um, okay. uh, some projects that I brought, some examples of Team Tan, which I think uh, are illustrative uh, at this stage, a university campus project. Uh, and I, the one I want to get to, and map buildings, probably you've seen all of this in our seminars. We had extensive discussions, I'm sure, um, of the potential of, let's say, thickening of the horizontal. That these uh, stem and mat are different type of typologies, but again, form enters the discussion in a different, different way. Um, what, and uh, this uh, Tim Tan story in this picture ends with a little, and this is a project for Tel Aviv, this huge uh, infrastructural, uh, let's say, project that kind of compacts administrative center to kind of linearity on the highway to give it a, uh, legibility and shape, that's the argument behind it. But what amazes me is in that project is that little sketch that I found out, I just rewrote it because it was illegible, but for of Broek and Bakema saying how to produce the visual reality called core, that's the basic project, respecting both the permanent small scale table and bed and desk and the ever increasing scale of administration and traffic and eventually harmonizing the relationship between the two of them. It's like this, how do I connect the table and the bed with this, it's like this uh, ambition to be really multi-scalar, to be able to talk about small but uh, uh, a large at the same side. So Team Tan stands within the story as a ghost, or Louis Search and his the emergent the discipline of urban design in quote, and nobody knows what that means. But at this case, in the context of 1960s, we know what that means. Um, but actually as a reaction again, this architectural reaction uh, to, to the dispersion of urban sprawl and putting back uh, form into that. We can have many discussions about his work and everything, but I think I see it uh, again in that, in that uh, way. And finally, uh, a final uh, basically probe is a very interesting one, which also has a relation to bigness, is uh, Matthias Unger's work and his ideas on gross form and then green archipelago afterwards. 
What is interesting about Ungers is its specific approach, marking an interest in the role of architectural form and its potential impact on the city, rather than, again, it was a kind of resonance between the previous neo-rationalists I was talking about, it's merely sociological conditions and underlying urban conditions. Second, warning that random collection of things remains as an amorphous mass that cannot go beyond the sum of its parts, Unger's articulation of gross form interests me as an expression of formal coherence, offering birth diversity, but also uh, offering a legible framework. Uh, since a small house, a housing block, or an entire city could be a gross form, gross form is independent uh, from actually scale. It's more about form than scale. One could argue that it is this tension between form and scale that one can conceptualize the relationship between gross form and bigness. And there is a story, again, one has to, it's not kind of a, like, Pick, picking out all the pictures and uh, resonances, but I mean, obviously there are historical uh, things behind them where Kuhas being one of the participants of a summer school that Ungers was teaching and he being part of that, uh, part of that uh, summer academy, which you see an Im uh, image of Green Archipelago project, and then taking that into, I think it's well illustrated right now, uh, of that story uh, to, to, uh, to something else. What makes a comparison, and I'm not gonna go through bigness, uh, which I think I kind of did, but again, I, uh, we can have a discussion about it. I'm sure we all know what that means. Uh, what makes their comparison more interesting is that bignesses, in words uh, especially, emphasis on basically scale mostly, meaning beyond a certain scale, once the large scale becomes large enough, the problem of form becomes something else, uh, so, it, you, so that you can address it with the conventional tools of architecture. Thus, one could argue that gross form's emphasis is form, bigness, at least in its claim, again, in its claim, there are always claims and, I think, realities, uh, that it's uh, more foreground scale. Second interesting point is that one could argue that as much as gross form is about form, it has taken a certain, let's say, take on urban context by, so that an, uh, Mart uh, Ungers was not interested in contextualism. He was interested in context, but not the Kola city contextualism, which basically he was teaching at the same time with Rowe, with Cornell, so, and there was a total battle, a productive one. Uh, with his departure from Kola City, amorphous bounded space contextualism on the one hand, or network expressions of Tin Tan, Ungers is, a, I think, uh, and I think it's, a, uh, let's say, emerging, I think uh, there are a lot of people studying Ungers also, that he's focused on typology and morphology. I find it, I find the idea of gross form and his work as uh, basically putting up a framework into the discussion of megaform. Um, with this emphasis, as you see in this image, on the freedom of active individual form objects, bounded again by active void space, uh, defined with a larger scheme that holds these elements together, this is the Green Archipelago project, is by Ungers also defined as gross form in a territorial scale. So, um, in a certain way, the project is, uh, again, I'm, I feel like because some of the things have already been covered in some of my courses and seminars, and there are a lot of people who already know these projects, so I feel like I don't have to go through uh, the projects. Uh, but uh, just to make sure that the uh, project was a speculative project, uh, produced for Berlin, and it, it became time to, rather than uh, fixing Berlin and the post-war Berlin, basically bringing void into the discussion of destruction of objects, so that the previous fabric of Berlin, if it's that, basically putting an emphasis into the form objects, their displacement, and how they would basically, uh, 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 let's say, illustrate a coherent territorial form. Uh, I will not, again, as I said, go into the uh, bigness discussion so much, as I, uh, but I, the link is obvious, uh, taking some of the ideas of the form object, I think, but, and get rid, getting rid of megastructure, contextualism uh, in the 60s. Bigness is also a mega form. Like it's, it sense in that history, it's an active form. I was actually, maybe I should, you should use the word active form or mega form because uh, one has to, that's one of my professors told me that I have to change the word. I should use the word mega form because it means something in the history. Um, so mega form marks an interest for me or active form. Uh, to think the role of architecture within urbanism, basically. The studios that I have taught at Rice all experimented on this idea, which is a cooking idea, uh, between the notion of endlessness and bounded form. My argument is that beyond a certain scale, you have to say, okay, but I mean, then what, what about bigness? What are you doing with bigness? But I think I'm interested in its rejection of context. So for me, in a way, the way I'm interested in form, it has a certain relationship to it, but it's not bound by it. It's not just responding to it. It affects it, basically. Um, 
if bigness uh, oh, uh, emphasize the bounded experimentation, uh, oh, I think it's 1247. So, um, so okay, let me uh, get to the conclusions. Um, I th uh, in a way, that's the part that I think it's the most uh, loose part in a way that uh, I, uh, these are the topics that I think are really uh, important in the context of the mega form for me. Uh, and topics of uh, new collective form, framing, new new monumentality, uh, specific objects, infrastructure organization <coughs> form. Each of them are, let me say, they are kind of cooking really ideas that derived from experimentation and talking about things. But for uh, new, I say new, not in a way to, uh, there's always like the ghost idea of the previous one, but rather than horizontality connoting ideas of open-endedness, non-limit, and, and verticality connoting the object, seeing or I'm interested in seeing horizontality as a dimension, as an urban, as a thick legibility, let's say. In other words, uh, forms of legibility embedded in the aggregate. So there's always, uh, I think, that the potential to, uh, uh, to, to play with that, uh, to question it, basically. Um, while Stan Allen would describe, let's say, field conditions as loosely bounded aggregates characterized by porosity and interconnectivity, where form is secondary, uh, uh, more than relationship between parts, uh, and form, he says, is, doesn't matter as much as relationship between things, the form is non-figural in that reading. Figure is a moment of intensity or a thickening of surface linked to a wider network, not a demarcated object. And I think I'm interested in that problematic of bringing, as if not resorting into any dichotomies, but to be able to talk about, uh, to be able to talk about the object um, uh, in a way that can give you an idea of diversity and collectivity, both in its, uh, the questions that it poses in terms of publicness, but also in terms of legibility. Um, I think all of these concepts, in a way, when I start talking about them, are really related. I feel like when I go into them, it repeats the other. But um, uh, how, uh, let's say, the form can uh, pose some questions in terms of the idea of public realm, not in a way that, because that's why I, I, that's why I find the new monumentality discussion really, really interesting, of the aim, in a way, the aim to uh, not to kind of solve our uh, frustrations in architecture, but like experiment that potentiality is interesting to me. Of how architecture uh, can pose a problem of legibility, uh, not resorting again into uh, those forces. And also um, uh, to be able to see infrastructure, organization of form uh, in, in, in a, in a they say different relationship. My plan was uh, to show you projects uh, from um, the Istanbul studio and then go through them very quickly. Um, but I also want to discuss with you these ideas and open it up. Um, but uh, maybe I should just conclude without showing the projects. Um, so if scale is a measure of, let me do this, let me read the conclusion with. Um, so. It's going to be tough, um, maybe impossible. Uh, if scale is a measure of relevance, not necessarily a size, uh, rather than large context or large scale as a as large context or large scale as an exaggerated depiction of emerging realities, I'm interested in the idea of architectural dimension when it is understandable and workable, strictly with the means or tools of our uh, of voc vocabulary as architects. The projects that I'm showing to you, which uh, I briefly talked about yesterday, very briefly, just uh, uh, was a chance, I actually, actually, I should say that everything started at that studio, of how Istanbul's edge, in a way, was posing this question if the dichotomy of the endlessness and boundary was there. You were going to either resort into a continuous infrastructural urbanism or you're going to construct another big object. So in a way, I think all the projects, now that I look back to it, uh, try to kind of mitigate uh, that dichotomy. Either in this project, Jessica Tankard's, uh, let's say, horizontal thickness, I think, was really, really uh, worked out in this project, which the basically, obviously, topographical potentialities of the city, uh, where with uh, using the, uh, let's say, datum line of topography, a thickness was created, embedded in the mat typology, uh, creating different uh, ways of living, different densities, public spaces. Um, or in the case of Nino, uh, really like contradicting the infrastructure with an object, using the uh, infrastructural data on the line uh, and proposing as, as, as a mega object uh, was his project. 
or in the case of uh, David Alf and Charles Sharpless, uh, another reading of the territory with codification of void and uh, solid systems, uh, let's say. Okay, I should uh, add some other projects, which is helpful. Um, and this semester uh, uh, is, uh, I'm teaching a studio titled Mundenium, which um, uh, in a way, Mundenium is a project that Le Corbusier did uh, in the 20s for, let's say, a new kind of typology of a information uh, library uh, knowledge, I say place of knowledge, which, which we are not looking at what is, I mean, the main uh, question of the studio is not, let's say, information technologies and what's the expression of that uh, in the 20th century, but more on using this paradoxical polemic between, because Mundenium was the project, I think, that posed the question of instrumentality versus form onto the picture, where there was a huge criticism after that to Le Corbusier of how he was basically so formalist, that he was criticized to be a formalist rather than a functionalist. So for me, uh, we are, uh, each student, we are using that topic in a way, let's say new library basically, but uh, to, to, to um, uh, experiment ideas of monumentality and infrastructure on a given site in Houston. Uh, so this is what I do generally, which I think is also helpful for the ones who don't know my studios, but that I mostly always start with a more of a disciplinary reading of the questions rather than going to the site. And these are some of the concepts that are, uh, I, I have to say, really cooking. Uh, but this is the first, um, the first part of the studio looks at specific projects in, in, in every, every topic and tries to extract ideas that were inherent in them, not to kind of take them and apply them, but more of create a certain discussion, construct a language of, of thought and thinking. Uh, and these are some panels that are going to be, uh, the book that you saw uh, um, yesterday is going to be another book. The, this, uh, it's the inter another interesting thing is because of the scale of the projects and the ideas we're looking, they are really totally different projects. So, and it's uh, interesting to see uh, how the uh, change of scale even changes the way we think about things, but that's another topic perhaps. But, um, and this is the board that's, uh, that's sitting, that's cooking, so I can't focus on that right much. In front of the door, if you're interested, um, we can go and talk about the projects. But I feel like I have to say another conclusive thing, but I feel like I'm speaking conclusively for about 10 minutes. But um, in a way, let me just finish with something just to open up a discussion, perhaps. Just to finish with a project is not. Um, so in the end, let me. Like in the end, our projects uh, and projects here that are cooking and cook, I think, uh, were and all are site specific. Although their architectural arguments attempt to go beyond that specific location. Um, in the case of Istanbul, while aiming to imagine the edge of the city as a speculative site of intervention, each project projected a critical reinterpretation of the endless growth of the city as well as insular island typologies. Instead of seeing large-scale intervention merely as an accommodation of processes, networks, and flows, where the project floats upon these forces and passively responds to a context, the studio and the studios that I'm teaching aim to formulate, which is my aim, I'm not claiming it's there already, but new forms of urban architectures that can act upon, shape, and be a factor of change in the city. That's it. discussion. Those who have to leave, please take note that there is another talk today at 4 o'clock. We have one of our faculty candidate talks with Zeynep Celik Alexander back here at 4. But I think, uh, so some people may have to leave now to go to studio, but um, those who can stay, we can continue a discussion when they're on. And actually, since I'm already talking, let me start with one question, which is, if you can elaborate a little bit on the question of legibility and form when, it, when form gets to be so big that you can't see form as a singular thing. And I think it was very helpful to see the studio projects even if so quickly, because I think that uh, Nino's project actually, by making the project a circle, uh, you're able to read the form even though you can never see the whole building, mm -hmm. right? Uh -huh. Uh, whereas Jessica's project 
was uh, as a mat is something that you you might be able to see the organization and from that extrapolate mm -hmm. an argument I see. about form. But I wonder where your discussion of um, legibility and form actually happens at that huge scale. It's a question I think that's very interesting. Yeah, I think form. I think it's a great question because in a way one could associate legibility to let's say merely to vision let's say, merely to a kind of a, how do I perceive this building? Or how do I see it? How do I understand it? And how do I combine pieces? And I, one part of me goes there. And because in the site that we're working right now, it's basically more, like, you can do that. You can really construct the argument in terms of, let's say, vision, perception. Um, let's say, how do you understand things as aggregates? And then there's a kind of, I think I can see that cooking in the studio that each project, not all of them, some of them are working on that. But when it comes to that's another scale, I think there is another scale of legibility, which is not about vision. It's not, it cannot just be about the Kevin Lynch, I have my drive, I mean, I just perceive it from the highway, I see that I construct this as a totality, but more of other modes of representation also interest me. Let's say Google, let's say new forms of representation that are offering new forms of legibility. So I think one has to, I guess, um, introduce that, uh, that dimension into, into the picture so that I'm saying that forms of legibility can be in different scale, which could be, I guess, uh, referred back to vision, referred back to perception. Um, but also I think it's really, right now it's even a more interesting topic of how to define legibility. How, how to, how, I think that's a question, that's an interesting one that I'm already thinking about. I don't know if it answers. I think I answered the real question already. But. The question is if Google replaces visual legibility or if they're simultaneous. Simultaneous, yeah. I mean, in a way they are... Um, you always have to have some level of visible, physical visibility or can Google carry it all? Can you, can you map out a network that, or an analogous network or representation that has no visual counterpart in the landscape? Yeah, I think it's... I say yeah, and then I can automatically argue no, kind of thing. But, um, but I, yeah, I mean, but what is that? Like, what do we mean by, when we say legibility, is it totality? Do we mean totality? Perception of a level of totality. I think that's what I mean by that. So I don't know if that only means going to the Google and seeing, oh, this building is really a star. I didn't see it when I was, I mean, is it that really simple? Or uh, there is something else out of there that, is also about you being in the city. And uh, uh, and also the form itself, I think I'm also interested in that. It's not just uh, parts versus whole, but that in a way, maybe it's again a very naive architectural belief, but that in a way that our power to form or shape the, the kind of the way that people experience place or construct public spaces in relation to that. So it's not about just a perception moment, but more of, um, forming the city, forming how things operate by architectural form rather than space or rather than, the, not, I don't want to put, put these things, it's very tricky, but in a way I think uh, I am interested in that disciplinary question of putting architecture back to the place. That's, that's, that's the clearest I can say because if I go more, I don't think it's going to. I'm, I'm curious about um, how, how you're designing address the experience of the individual and the idea of isolation within such a large form and within such a you know, metropolis-oriented world, and how, how, how that can be brought down to the small level of each person and their experience in the space and with the materials, etc. I think that's a good question. I think that as much as it sounds, because the way that we talk about form and space, it just goes to legibility, collectivity, but I mean, obviously there's all, all that human association, which is a word actually Team Time would use a lot, but that, I mean, that goes back to the human experience moment. And the individual versus collective, when you say that, that's a very loaded term, but um, in a way, if you look, I mean, it's easy to explain them through the projects, but in a way, the once you have a scalar decision, once you say my housing units will be in that scale, or my house, there will be like five units facing this garden, and there will be a like bigger public space that will have, I don't know, 50 units. Like by that simple decision, automatically, by its definition, you are defining how people will operate, how people will see each other in that courtyard, and how people will see each other in a larger piazza, let's say. So. Uh, 
all of these things are embedded in the in the question itself so that it's not only a matter of um, compilation but more of when you define these units right they are place, places that people live so that automatically affects their interaction by the way you're defining it by the way you're framing it so was it oh, yes okay <laughs> More a comment and less a question. But are you familiar with the work of this? Um, I think she's an anthropologist, Anand Singh, who wrote this book called Friction. Friction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your discussion of flows and you know networks reminded me of that. And the argument there is that it's precisely this idea of friction that this is the mode in which globalization yeah. uh, uh, operates. So I'm, and you mentioned the word only once uh -huh, in uh -huh. your talk, but I wonder if you could take it and make it a more operative. Or, you know, if you could endow it with more agency in a way, the term itself, because in many ways it's a question of friction and contingency, and uh -huh. um, it's precisely that you know, question of connecting it to the, it wasn't the bed and the, uh, yeah. the chair of that. Yeah. I think that I'm uh, not fully, I, I think I read an article, or I, I, that part of that book, Fire, what is the book's name? There's a fire, and the, I forgot the name of the book, uh, Friction. But in a certain way, I think it's a little bit because it's a specific story about the forests and like a kind of a local, basically, of uh, friction to the kind of larger systems that are imposed onto it. Um, there is that kind of, when you say agency, that's very interesting, actually, because when you look at it from an anthropological point of view and say agency, it comes back to the, let's say, community, the group, the group form of the individual, of the people. And when you say collective and the automatic, that's why I find Team Tan's work very interesting because there is that battle in Team Tan that there is a kind of anthropological or sociological always kind of resonance and also like form is translated in a way that you would never see. Um, that I find it very interesting of how me reading an anthropologist in that way, and I, that's what I felt of. Like I sometimes feel that by friction, uh, there's, it's really more of a bottom-up reaction or, uh, to the kind of imposing larger system, which is very interesting. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting uh, just because that I like I like what you say because in a way that brings he, she I mean he she I don't I don't know if she she brings the um, idea of in a way like questioning flows basically that's I think why you were bringing it. But it's less a um, matter of resistance and more um, something about the logic of globalization that she's interested in. Yeah. It's more about the logic of what? Sorry. Global, I'm sorry, I, I have a call. Sorry. Uh, the logic of globalization. Yeah, by that I, that's what I meant, anti, there's a kind of that anti bottom up, anti flows, anti globalization. Um, it, it dawned on me as you were speaking, it's very interesting to talk, thank you, uh, but the, the there's a the term pattern, which occurs, it has a sort of Jekyll and Hyde relationship to scale, or the size of the system. And that at the large scale, it seems to me that pattern is consistently necessary to uh, understand, explain, and to a certain extent, uh, legitimize those systems. But at the small scale, say at the scale of a building, pattern gets pushed into decoration, and is easily shed, or there's a desire to often shed the notion of pattern. So I'm trying to figure out if pattern... Why do you say pattern? Well, you wouldn't characterize the systems you're describing as pattern, but I mean you have pattern to... laid in some form. Whether, whether someone more random or more structured, I would, I would characterize almost all of them as pattern. Because it's pattern it's automatically it's brings that organization, isn't it? That, that well, I think I think that's that's part of the visualization of organization. That's part understand. of what I might presume to be the answer. But that's what I'm kind of curious. It, it seems legitimate at the large scale, and we tend to unload it. It's actually kind of half commented, just wondering whether you, the large scale it works, and the, at the small scale it seems uh, corrupting. Decoration. No, I, I see what you're saying, but I can't associate the, because automatically when I say pattern, do you mean it's kind of surface connotations of that word or more is a spatial? Stuff on the screen, and it, usually it was regions. It was very, very big stuff. Roads, masses of, it could be economic information, it could be social information, whatever it is, but we grasp it through pattern. Huh. Actually, 
Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting point because if you think about the work of, I mean, okay, let me answer it in the opposite way. I think as architects we think through patterns in a way that we are a little bit more superficial than we think. That even if we push it harder and harder, at the end of the day we come to the pattern. Like we have to face it. That's how we think. So maybe I'm reverting the question, but if we start with that assertion, that is interesting in a way because you're right. Like. Even in the scale of things, and the, the scale that I'm working right now in the studio is in like three blocks. So it's again large. So what would happen if you take that question to a building scale? Are you really adding something new, or is it just about it just works in the larger scale? But when I say, take the pattern into the discussion, uh, I never thought about it. But in a way, maybe there's something else there which I never thought about. That it's when it's really like a very uh, by by small. Do you mean like a block or a plot scale or building or? Do you have an association in terms of? I think, I think I think we tend to as soon as it becomes building, that becomes increasingly. I don't, I, I'm, I'm reducing the arguments, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying that there, I'm saying there's a tendency for pattern to become decoration at the small scale. So whether it's building or block or whatever it might right. be, right? I'm, I'm, it's actually more a curiosity about the role of pattern in a discipline which can stretch from building to region or larger. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a curiosity about the, the because pattern has been placed back into the discourse by various people in different ways. I'm just wondering whether you've given that thought. I think that I think that within that pattern, let's say because of maybe because of my background of how I took those things, rather than reversing back to the story and if you take the unit of one and say how it affects the large, rather because I always say there is I'm interested in the effect, I'm interested in the force, how architecture frames, sharpens or shapes. In that way, from the unit to the collective, let's say from the building to the city maybe in a way might be interesting that not only uh, how I'm just but I'm reacting to the large versus building but I never I cannot associate it to the pattern in a way I don't know for me automatically pattern flat pattern is a surface condition so yeah um, I was interested in the I'm interested in the starting point of the North Sea project because uh, to me the site is actually not it didn't seem like that it was necessarily to receive a type of crisis. A crisis is a model of transformation. Uh, and I'm interested, since you, know, you, you talk about it throughout the talk, um, of, of, of megaform in effect as a kind of model of transformation within the city itself. I'm wondering where crisis actually figures into your discussion today. We saw it as a kind of starting point. But I'm wondering, uh, where is it in your, in your thinking today? Is there a kind of necessary relation between uh, uh, make a form crisis. Uh, I think yes, absolutely. I think that yeah. it's really my personal crime. Mean, let's say my positioning as an architect within larger forces as a crisis. And I, if you uh, and the whole crisis is our inability to talk about form in that in the context of the mega form, I would say the crisis of kind of loosening of things in a way that it's either about inversion or a uh, So that actually dichotomy that I'm laying out is a crisis, is a disciplinary crisis, but a, a potential and interesting one. So I think that the crisis of the North Sea, in a way, uh, and its relation to 70s more, was more like a political crisis, right? And right now, because of the crisis that we're in, in the larger, let's say, sustainability topics, our way of dealing with things and design our boundaries or architects is a crisis. We either have to go to either, let's say, have green buildings or kind of immerse ourselves to a kind of a discussion that's beyond our uh, limits, or we have to construct beautiful objects and buildings. So, like, I guess for me, that is the crisis, but again, a potential one. So it's a more of a disciplinary crisis. Okay. I mean, I'm also thinking of the next I mean, we were actually, I mean, besides, I mean, we talked a lot about crisis today. There are crazy things yesterday, actually. The school is the, that in some ways, this is one of the practices of crisis. But we're also in a, uh, I mean, in my own life, I'm not especially in St. Lots, but five, ten years. I mean, we've experienced kind of urban scale crises uh, in a way that, you know, you know as a child, I never remember. And it's, it's interesting to, to see and think about architecture at this scale. Uh, in particular moments of crisis, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's kind of infrastructural breakdown, financial meltdown, the most recent not being the only one we're also talking about, perhaps the 70s, the 60s, the United States. Anyway, I, I'm interested in that. I think that
that price is interesting because it brings the moment of relevance. That you have to like, you have to define how as an architect. I mean, it's either again you go to a resort, but if you have problems in a way of positioning yourself as an architect, that is the potential moment of the crisis. So by by when I say disciplinary agency specificity, I think that uh, it is a way of you dealing with as an architect for that limit or defining what that limit is. So so it's a porous one. I would say we're, we're facing a temporal crisis right now or at the beginning of the because studio. Because of me. So <laughs> um, the discussion will have to percolate in a more informal way. But I want to thank you for uh, the great Thanks talk. Thanks so much. Thank you.